it, everyone. It's three o'clock, so we'll start our third event of the day. I can't believe how fast it's gone by so far. Um, I'm Rebecca Redeal. I'm the director of HistFest. I'm delighted to introduce our next event, Courting India, England, Mughal India, and the Origins of Empire with Nandini Das and Sunny Singh. First of all, and I do apologise because I know lots of you have heard this already, but I do need to run through some housekeeping. Um, we'll take questions towards the end of the talk. Um, so if you have... If you're thinking of a question, please um, raise your hand towards the end and we'll see if we can get them answered by the um, panellists. Um, if you're watching online, you can submit a question using the question box at the bottom of the video. Books, um, there are books on sale outside and there will be a book signing afterwards. Um, should you wish to get your book signed, which I urge you to. <laughs> um, and if you're watching online, you can also access um, the tab, I think it's at the top of the screen, to um, go to the British Library's bookstore and purchase books that way. This event, like all the events at HistFest, will, be, will have live speech-to-text captioning and also live BSL interpretation. If you're watching online, you can access this using the tab below the video um, if you need to use it. Okay, our speakers. Um, so, first of all, Sunny Singh. Sunny is a, pre a, pre -a, a professor of creative writing and inclusion in the arts at London Metropolitan University and an expert on Bollywood. She's the founder of the Jalak Prize, first awarded in March 2017, and its sister award, the Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize, which was founded in 2021. Um, which celebrates books by British or British resident writers of colour. She's the author of the criti critically acclaimed novels, um, an award-winning actually novel, Nanny's Book of Suicides, um, With Krishna's Eyes and Hotel Arcadia. She's currently, uh, sorry, she's recently completed a selection of stories linked by the theme of war and a personal study of the Indian film industry titled A Bollywood State of Mind, which is coming in October this year. Nandini Das, we have another professor here. Nandini Das is the professor of early modern English, uh, English literature and culture, and a fellow of Exeter College at the University of Oxford. She's a scholar of Renaissance literature, travel, migration, and cross-cultural encounters, and has published widely on these topics from their... Um, and published widely on these um, on these topics. Her works include, I had to check the pronunciation of this, so forgive me if I, I mispronounce it again, Robert Greene's Planet of Machia, yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, Renaissance Romance, The Transformation of English Prose Fiction, 1570 to 1620, and her latest book, Courting India, England, Mughal India, and the Origins of Empire, which she's here to talk to us about today. Sunny Nandini, over to you. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, before I kick off, I can't recommend this book highly enough, so please go get it when you leave. Um, and I promise you that's not just a sales pitch. I, I spent much of the last few weeks reading it um, and going back and taking notes, um, and I will be reading it again quite soon. Um, so it, it is really quite, quite, quite a necessary book, it's a very important book, and it fills a gap in our understanding of the period, both for India and for Britain, that I think is not only needed right now for multiple reasons, but also quite urgent. So Nandini, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. And I didn't even have to bribe her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to talk about the bribes later. <laughs> I'm not talking about it now. Um, but I'm going to actually, you said something earlier when we were preparing or we were sitting in the green room about how it took, it's, it's nearly a decade's work. And I, I think I want to start off with that. Um, tell us, because, because this book is so incredibly researched, there's so much archival material in there. Um, I think every page I was making a note of like, I didn't know that, oh wow. And you know, there are all these, these these points of extraordinary bits of information that you've woven together. So tell us about this 10-year this research project. <laughs> um, well, it started off um, as a conversation, as books quite often do. Um, it started off as a conversation between myself and a senior colleague, 
um, in the US who wanted to invite me to do an essay on something of my choice about encounters between cultures in the 16th and 17th century. And I was knee deep in writing an early, uh, my previous book at that point, which was very much about European intellectual history. And I thought, well, I'll do something that is slightly lighter, maybe, and I can do it quickly. <laughs> um, so I started off by writing um, an article about that painting. Um, it's called The Emperor Jahangir Preferring a Sufi Sheikh to Kings. And if you notice in the corner over there, that grumpy face peering out at us, um, that's the face of a man who's been waiting far too long for a bus, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> that, we suspect, is a copy from a portrait of James I. Um, we know that Thomas Rowe, the, the first English ambassador to India, had taken multiple portraits with him. Um, and that man in the red turban in the corner is the artist. We know that because he's holding a painting in his hand. He's called Basawan. Um, and he copied James's grumpy face into this particular painting where the Mughal emperor turns his face away. So the article was all about imitation, European ideas and Islamic um, and Asian ideas of what in, in Latin, in, among, uh, among Thomas Rowe's contemporaries would be known as imitatio, um, and how this is both a competition but also an act of hospitality. Um, when you're imitating something, you're welcoming it into your own space. But at the same time, you're marking out that space as your own territory. Um, so I, was, I worked on that for ages, and then there was a moment where over the lockdown, again, not a good decision. I'm not putting this across very well here. And this is a string of terrible decisions, really. <laughs> Over the lockdown, I decided, well, what better time than to do something that is really terribly archive heavy when you can't go to the archives. <laughs> um, but I had done a lot of work on Thomas Rowe's journal, and we might talk about the journals themselves later. Um, already, so I had a wealth of, thankfully, transcriptions and photographs that I could pour over. And the help of multiple friends who very generously, when the lockdown lifted, would come in and take lots more photos for me. Um, and that's all that went into that doorstop of a book. And you've nicely opened to my next question, which is, let's talk about Thomas Rowe. <laughs> Not just his journals, which are extensive and, and quite, quite interesting and at times amusing. I, find, I at least mm. in my view, quite, quite sort of think, really? <laughs> you know, there, there, there's, there's that moment of um, that hapless Englishman, sort of straight out of the Indiana Jones you know, movie, where it's like, really, you don't know what you're doing, are you? Do you? <laughs> but, but tell us about Thomas Rowe and tell us about his, his ambassadorship. But, but more importantly, his journals, because I think that's one of the, the key resources we have. Mm. Yeah, it is. Um, I suppose to understand who Roe is, it's kind of useful to think of our mental kind of map in terms of timeline. So if you think about England in the 16th and 17th centuries, the people who come to our mind are Elizabeth I and James I. Um, across the oceans in India, in Mughal India, so northern India and a bit of central India, although the Mughals are still trying to make inroads there, um, the direct contemporaries among the monarchs is Akbar the Great and Emperor Jahangir. So Elizabeth I and Akbar the Great, um, who really establishes the Mughal Empire, are direct contemporaries and then their successors. Um, similarly, um, Roe is someone who comes to the English court in the very last years of Elizabeth I's reign. And he's one of those very typical mixtures, actually, um, among the new courtiers of the period. So on his father's side, he comes from very solid mercantile stock. So he has a string of Lord Mayors of London among his father's family on that side of the family tree. 
Um, and then his father, who's the third son, dies quite young. His mother remarries into the glitzier courtly circle. So that's where the glamour and glitz in his life comes from. And he's really ambitious. He also, by the point when he starts kind of hobnobbing with the great and the powerful um, in England, um, is also quite cash strained. Um, and that has, you'll realize um, that this thing about tight wallets is a recurrent theme throughout the book. Um, in a way. So Roe is desperate to earn some money. So are the English merchants. And they have a big problem on their hands because, of course, um, Elizabeth's straightened relationship with continental Europe meant that English trade had suffered. The one thing that the English did really well was produce excellent wool. But all of a sudden, the taxes on doing business with Europe, continental Europe, had gone up. So the recurrent conversation among the trading merchants was a vent for our English wool. Where can we find an alternative market? Now, let's face it, perhaps northern India in the summer was not the right place to go to um, for that. But there was another reason, which is the luxury goods market. England was very keen on Eastern luxuries. And till this point, they were going through a third party, the Venetians and the Italians, through the land routes into the Ottoman Empire. And then they would get all this fancy stuff that would all come back to London um, and be sold in the great shops of London. Um, but they wanted an alternative, cheaper route. And East India Company was very keen on doing that. They were also very keen on sending someone they could depend on, and the man was Thomas Rowe. This young man, very promising, very keen, would do his work and would, he would do his paperwork faithfully. <laughs> yes, he's, he's extremely, extremely keen on noting every possible interaction, every possible, it's quite, quite, quite marvelous that the level of detail he puts in there. It is, I mean, I, I had such a fabulous time just within, well, not within this building exactly, just across the courtyard um, in the British Library looking at his journal, the manuscript copy, where he writes down everything. I mean, mind you, the man knew that his salary depended on it. Um, the East India Company was quite kind of deliberate about insisting that their employees do their paperwork um, and have um, everything noted down. If you've ever grumbled about filing an expense receipt, <laughs> have sympathy for Thomas Rowe, who had to note down everything. But that is wonderful for us as historians. We know exactly what he spent his money on. Yes, <laughs> very true. Now, I found that the, the parallels, I, I will not go in there perhaps because I shall, I shall say too much, but the idea of, of not having access to European markets <laughs> makes a little too close. Um, maybe, maybe that Empire 2.0 dream wasn't entirely unfounded. <laughs> but I want to come back to your writing because you'd been working all of this and then somehow you decided to pull this book together. Now, what struck me is that, of course, there's much of Roe in there, but, but it's way beyond that. And what it tries, and I think very, very, you know, accomplishes very well and quite, quite comprehensively, is to give us an insight into what's happening in both these places. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when we, when in this country, um, especially when people say, oh, we, we have shared history. It's a very dodgy way of phrasing, um, you know, a long history of murder and looting and so on. <laughs> but I think here there's, there is something really special going on because this is in a way a shared history because this embassy changes both Britain and India That's in right. ways that is not expected at the time, it's not even imaginable at the time. Talk us through that part, because I found that so insightful and so fascinating. Oh, that's such a lovely question, Sunny. Um, so one of my frustrations to some extent about 
our current historical narratives about British empire or the history of empire. Partly is to do with the fact that it goes to the bit where the empire actually exists in India and in Asia. Um, and that means quite often this early period, so um, Roe goes out in 1614-15, this early period gets covered very quickly, if it even appears, before you go to Clive and the rest of that very familiar story. So partly I was interested in excavating that. But in doing that, one of the things that always fascinates me about cross-cultural contact in any given moment is the mechanisms of that contact. Um, we quite often think about first meetings happening almost in a vacuum. But the thing is, first meetings are never entirely new. You know, they're always framed by our assumptions, our preconceptions. So one of the things that I really wanted to excavate from Rose side and from the English side was the kind of lenses through which he was looking at this court that he was encountering. The Mughal court is immensely powerful. Its annual revenue is about 10 times the national revenue of England in this period. It's huge in some ways. So what does a man do when he lands in Surat and makes his way to Ajmer and looks at the grandeur of this court? What kind of lenses that he, does he use? So that was one aspect, I think, where that parallel comes in. But for me, the other really important thing was that sometimes when we are thinking about these grand histories of empire, we think of them in the abstract as abstract concepts and machinery. We think of the East India Company as this huge corporation. And the ordinary people, the everyday lives get lost within that. Particularly the everyday lives of people who only appear in historical fragments. Because let's face it, you can't whip out an entire book out of half a line um, in a court record, perhaps. But the thing is, those people were there and their lives were touched by what happened, perhaps across the seas, somewhere else. So for me, there are glimmers of those figures which I really wanted to accommodate, right from people like Eleanor Rowe, the woman who falls in love with Thomas Rowe and marries him two months before he has to leave for India. Um, so there are characters like that, but on the other hand, there are other characters like Rowe's interpreter, a man called Jadu, or Jadu, perhaps, we don't know how his name might have been you know, kind of pronounced, um, who interprets for Thomas Rowe and for the East India Company for, we, we suspect, for about 12 years, almost. And he comes up in little exchanges. We know little glimpses of him. We know that he wasn't ever happy with the salary he got. In fact, he was drastically underpaid. Again, we come back to money. Um, we know that there was a moment where his son got married and he needed to take leave. And for me, I find those really important, as well as those huge movements of ships and huge profits and the grand narratives of colonial movement and violence. So, you know, this book is to some extent, in fact, to a large extent, not simply the story of Roe, but of all those lives. And you've just opened up a question that I was going to ask you um, afterwards, but I might as well ask you now. Um, that name Jadu st stayed with me, and not only because of the Bollywood movie with Hrithik Roshan, where the you know extraterrestrial is called Jadu, <laughs> but it means magic. Mm. And I kept wondering, is that is that a name that he's given? Is that a pseudonym? Is that something that he's you know mm. you know because it's a very strange name but there's something really lovely and, and quite magical about it did you have any sense of what that may be would you anything else that you didn't put in the book that you might give us give us a sense of who he is mm, that's that's really interesting i was fascinated with jadu um and i spent far too long i think trying to track him down to some extent um because of exactly those questions now Jadu in Hindi um, means magic. There's a possibility that it could be Jadu, 
um, which is a name of Vishnu. So that gives us a different angle into him. He might be from the Hindu mercantile community in Surat, um, where Roe and the East India Company settled for quite a long time. Um, but we don't really know much about him apart from those traces. Um, and in that sense, I think for me, people like him become in some ways symbols of that wider picture of quite interesting negotiations that were going on in this period, which is not, which is very different actually from the later colonial governance structures and relationships within that. Rose's relationship with Jadu or Jadu is very different from the master-servant relationships that happen later on because Ro is so dependent on him. He's terrible at languages and he does not want to learn Persian. So he's entirely dependent on this Indian man to get his point across. There's a moment where Jadu, as ever, goes off in a huff. He asks for a raise, he doesn't get a raise, partly because Ro himself is broke. Um, Ro doesn't want to admit that to him because, you know, slightly awkward, um, but so Jadu leaves him and goes away. And as the universe would have it, the very next week, Ro gets a rare chance to talk to the emperor while the emperor is out and about. And you have that moment in his diaries where he's going, if only I had my Jadu with me, I could have said something apart from the broken bits of Persian and then the emperor laughed at me and I don't know whether he just thought I was hilarious or he was laughing at me or with me. It's all just terrible, going terribly. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's something so interesting about this figure, about the translator. And I kept thinking, of course, of, of other, not only English um, attempts to make contact so, you know, but also European event, um, attempts and, and, and the role of the translator in that. And, and I've, of course, you know, we think of people like Malinche who, in Mexico, who is deeply reviled by the Mexicans for having played a part in, in the colonization and the destruction of the, the Aztec empire. But here it's, it's a very strange space that, Jadu or Jadu mm. occupies. And the reason that we're, we're, we're coming up with two translations is because there isn't a diacritical mark to figure out how this word mm. is pronounced. Um, but I think what, what struck me while I was reading it is that we get some glimpse of that, but there are even smaller glimpses of lives that we don't often talk about. Curiously enough, given Elizabeth is on the throne here, the women mm -hmm. on both sides. That's right. And children. And children, of course. And, and sort of people whose, whose lives are going to be transformed, not just in that moment, but for generations, centuries onwards, are not really visible or talked about or told. And you've somehow managed to find these little glimmers. So tell us about this, because this was, this was really fascinating for me, how you've kind of found these little little traces. Well, for me, the, the most striking point, you know, when you're writing a book, quite often you come to a point where you suddenly, despite the fact that you've got a looming deadline and you have an increasing tendency to question your decision <laughs> to write the, the, the book in the first place, um, you suddenly come to a moment where you think, Actually, this is not half bad. Um, I'm glad I'm doing this here and now. For me, one of those moments was poring over um, an early 16th century map of London. And there's a moment in around 1614, 1615, where I was trying to make a case in a very early chapter about the ways in which English voyages and English global encounters were intricately interconnected. So their agency, their kind of travels to North America, their travels to the Spice Islands with you know, Indonesia basically, and their travels in Asia and the Middle East to the Ottoman empires are all very, very closely linked, both in terms of material, but also in terms of people. 
And I don't mean just people who are going out of England, but the people who were coming in. So that moment in late 1614, 15, early 1616 in England, um, is a moment where there's a man from Western Africa called Corey. Again, we don't know what the original pronunciation of his name would have been, whether he was called Corey at all, but that's what the English called him. Um, one particular, particular English ship which had um, kind of stopped near his village, kidnapped him and brought him back um, with them to, to London, to Philpott Lane in the city where the East India Company had their headquarters at the time. Um, and he became one of their kind of examples, their kind of PR tools, essentially, except that Corey was homesick and he wanted to go home. Um, so his is one of the very early voices we have of people from Western Africa, whose spoken voices we hear in historical records. Um, and it's a voice which says, Corey, go home. And that's all we hear about him. And I found that hugely moving for myself. But then you start triangulating, and within about five miles of where Corey was, there was another woman who had been brought in by the Virginia Company. You know, East India Company is doing its own little PR, Virginia Company would also be doing its own little PR. And the woman, this time a woman, who's brought in is a name that is much more familiar to all of us, Pocahontas. Um, so there's Pocahontas, there's Corey the Saldanian, and then there's an Indian woman. So stepping back in the story a little bit, there's a man who goes to India to the Mughal court before Thomas Rowe, a man called William Hawkins, a chancer and an adventurer and slightly tricky figure. He gets married off by the Mughal Emperor Jahangir to an Armenian Christian woman called Mariam Begum. So for that glimpse, for those Englishmen walking the streets of London in around 1615, within about five miles of them, there would have been a man from Western Africa, a very equally homesick woman from Mughal India, and a woman from Northern America, with them leave, living and breathing the same air. And I think it's hugely important to acknowledge that and bring that into the story of you know, cultural encounters, of the emergence of imperial and, and colonial ambition, but also in the stories of engagement with the wider world that England was going through in this period. And of course, that opens up a whole Pandora's box around erotic and sexual encounters um, as well, and what that may entail for for not just the people involved, but of course us, who are, who all trace our lineages back in different ways mm -hmm. to, you know, directly or indirectly to the same these people. Um, I want to shift a little bit, and I want just to talk about your writing. Okay. And the reason I want to talk about it, because I think a lot of us who work in academia or work in writing books or do anything, found the lockdown immensely disorientating. And here you were, you produced a book and an enormous, incredibly information-packed, insightful book. How? <laughs> and this, this is me looking, you know, this is my cheat sheet, okay? I'm going to use these, uh, these ideas. Ow. Uh, it's amazing what having an editor who makes pointed calls reminding you of deadlines can do. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I think it's partly because it's a story that I wanted to tell. Um, it's also significantly due to the enormous patience of one's family. Um, and that cannot be said enough, particularly since said family is present in this crowd. <laughs> um, but, um, but apart from that, I think it's also because it's a story that was absolutely crying out for the telling. 
And having the journals, not only Rowe's journal, which I've, we've talked about a little bit, his daily records, but then from the other side, it's very rare that you get multiple, almost day-to-day -day accounts of a series of events that you can juxtapose against each other. Uh, and to my shock and horror, I realized that I, I was actually using Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> Sunny, I mean, that was traumatic, that realization, <laughs> and liking that experience. Um, but it is one of those cases where you could see what was happening on a given day. And there is something, I think, particularly wonderful about being able to drill down to a single day in a distant past and juxtapose two very different voices. The voice of a dysentery stuck, exhausted Englishman in the heat of Ajmer who refuses to wear anything but English wool um, in August. Um, and the voice of the Mughal emperor Jahangir who is tracking the progress of the nesting of his pet cranes and keeping a day-to-day -day deeply um, interesting naturalist's kind of account of the way that nesting process works. Um, and there was something really wonderful about it. So I think it's entirely thanks to that material to some extent. And of course, Jahangir is wearing muslins. The, yes. lightest, the <laughs> lightest and most glorious of muslins, none of the wool for him. <laughs> Not in August. Well, there, there's a moment where um, one of the East India Company factors or merchants writes back saying, we've brought a lot of wool and you've kept sending us more wool. This is the moment where you stop sending us any more wool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is, it, it, I have to say, this, this book is, in addition to being a doorstop, insightful, informative, is also a lot of fun. There's lots of these brilliant moments um, where you suddenly feel that, you know, maybe 1600s people weren't that different in their concepts. Well, you know, I mean, that's one of the, I'm so glad you said that because the, that's the kind of experience I kept coming across reading these records. So there's one moment where an East India Company um, man writes back to the company in, in London and he says, well, you know, this business with wool not quite working out. Um, you've asked me to find rarities in India. I've just tasted the most wonderful thing. They have a fruit called a mango. And what they do is that they dry it. And then you can keep it for longer. Do you think that would sell if I managed to send you some of that? And that moment of a man enjoying and discovering the delights of dried mango is such a human moment um, that it's utterly wonderful, I think. It's quite funny that you picked that particular moment because um, I've been working in a collection of short stories and one of the things I found in my research was, was some of the Sikh soldiers who were serving in Europe mm. would often carry dried mango with them. It travels well. It travels he was very not well. Wrong. And in fact, <laughs> I had to build it into a short story because it was this, this amazing moment of carrying dried mangoes, <laughs> which is, you know, it happens. <laughs> it's important. Um, but yeah, um, I want to have, I know that we, we will be moving towards audience questions. So, you know, there will be time, but I actually want to ask you something about memory. Mm -hmm and the role of memory. And I think, you know, historians, I think, always struggle with it because, you know, memory in itself tends to be quite slippery and quite, you know, it slides and slips and elides. And yet it's, it's continuous and it perseveres and it's resilient and it's transformative in different ways. Mm -hmm. And how does that play out? And I, I want to connect it back to some of these ideas or, that you said about cross-cultural encounters, these first meetings. How does memory play out in these, the, these spaces, mm. in these, these strange encounters? Um, not just, you know, the mango, you know, can there be a memory of a mango? Sort of, you know, <laughs> but, but, but really beyond the, mm. beyond the facetiousness, yeah. th I, I really want to, ask you because it's something that you 
you know, it's a, it's a through thread, the yeah. idea of memory and, and how it continues to impact us now. Um, yeah. would, would you talk, let us, you know, tell yeah. us about it? Well, for me, I think it's not only a through thread in this book, but it's part of the methodology behind the book in the sense that uh, one of the things that I really wanted to excavate is the way in which certain assumptions and certain narratives about India and about the Mughals and the Mughal Empire develops and the long shadow that leaves for the next couple of centuries or even longer um, within British perceptions of India, um, particularly as the British begin to cons consolidate their power in, in South Asia. Um, and one of the things that keep cropping up for historians in historical debates about these early years when historians have looked at Thomas Rowe's journals is his response, for instance, um, to the very powerful female presences at the court, particularly to Jahangir's favorite 20th wife, Noor Jahan, who had just been crowned empress alongside him. Noor Jahan is immensely powerful. Um, Thomas Rowe is, feels very strongly about Noor Jahan's influence on Jahangir. So he creates this image in his journal about a kind of Mughal male effeminacy that allows the Mughal emperor to be driven by women, um, to be heckled by women. And he imagines this kind of, he in fact uses this um, phrase of a pit of vipers in the harem who are negotiating and machinating. If you take it in isolation, it seems a particularly strong reaction, but in some ways, I suppose for me, as someone who had specialized for a long time on 16th and 17th century English um, cultural history and literature, um, the thing that fascinated me was the very clear resonances it sets up with public discourse around James I in England and his relationship with his wife, Anna of Denmark, for instance. They had a fraught relationship. Anna herself had an alternative court, almost, that was set up around her. Um, so in some ways, I, what I was keen to excavate is what happens when you have to decode a different political or social structure? What tools do you use in order to open that particular can of worms? Usually what happens is that the tool you use is memory. You use the framework you have. So for Roe, his constant emphasis on the monarch being um, open to manipulation in India, taken in a vacuum, is a judgment on the Mughal Empire and on the Mughal Emperor, taken alongside um, the discourse around and the deep anxiety around royal scandals in early 17th century London, it becomes com something completely different. It becomes an anxiety about political power, about tyranny, about the way in which in England at that same time, the, the, the parliament, for instance, was negotiating with the monarch. Um, so I think for me, that becomes the through thread in a way, that kind of juxt constant juxtaposition of what was happening in England when Roe left, what the letters that he was getting, and the way in which those crop up as resonances in his en engagement with this completely different court. It's quite interesting because I, I don't think he ever manages to see the Mughal court for itself. He's, he's constantly, he's, he's interpreting everything and and I think if, if you know the other side, then you keep, I keep going, oh, you silly man, I wanted to shake him and go, <laughs> bring something, go talk to somebody. You know, they, there's so much you're missing. But, but I think, you know, that, that, that sort of lack of understanding or lost in translation, however we want mm. to, to, to... Well, I don't know whether it's it. even lost in translation. Sometimes I think it's quite deliberate on his part. So you get the sense where there is a moment of 
understanding or connection or whatever you might call it, he has that moment with an aging courtier at the Mughal court. At one point, he has that moment with Jahangir himself. But at the same time, there is a deep weight, I think, um, and deep anxiety about his own powerlessness and the powerlessness of the English, which he's constantly trying to balance by negating the power of the Mughal court. There's a wonderful moment where he sits through an hour-long procession of gifts being presented to Jahangir, which includes things like 30 elephants with platters of gold coins on their backs. And there is Ro himself saying, I don't really have a good gift for Jahangir for his birthday this, this time. So I looked into what I had and I've got a couple of miniatures. I put it in a pretty box and hopefully that'll do. <laughs> so he does that, he explains all of that. And then he puts in a throwaway comment which says, well, it's all very ostentatious and it's a bit like a rich merchant's wife in um, Shoreditch, displaying her fancy velvet slippers in the same cupboard as her fancy new Chinese porcelain, isn't it? Um, so you have that kind of tension, which is both deliberate and sometimes subconscious, perhaps, of hoping to cut things down to a place where you can engage with it. I think it's just too big for him. Now, I think one of the, the, the words you use, the, the casting of the long shadow of these narratives, um, we're in a very strange moment because um, just as this, you know, I was reading this book, um, the news has come out that um, the Mughals have been removed, although that may be, I mean, that may be a little too extreme, but they've been definitely whittled away from the Indian curriculum. And, and I think that, that that's such a bizarre thing to, to do um, with any kind of history. But I think it also um, made me realize just how much of our anxieties around the past are about today and the future rather than the past. Um, but here is, here is a strange problem. What happens when we remove the memory? Because it's not as if removing the curriculum from you know, Mughals mm. from the curriculum will remove the Mughals from history. And yet there is this very strange process of, of trying to create a narrative. I think that comes down to some extent to perhaps an increasing perception that history somehow has a limited capacity. It's it's like a little box and you can only pack this much in to it. And if you have to put something in, something else has to go out. Yeah. Um, and we think of a complete understanding being somehow confused with erasure, which is not the case. Um, and that happens in discourses around our understanding of Mughal history. It happens around our discourses of understanding of British history, of English history. Um, I think what I hope Courting India helps to show is that actually history is pretty capacious, perhaps more than we give it credit for. Um, there are multiple voices within it um, and erasing some of them simply leaves a lacuna in our understanding. It doesn't change history in any sense. Um, it just makes us less capable of understanding what the past was and that is always a sad thing to be aiming towards, a limitation of knowledge, um, I think. Um, so in most of these cases, I think recovery and extension and enrichment is probably what, as historians and as scholars, we need to be aiming towards, um, rather than this limiting of the lens. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, I also think that this book goes a long ways in, in deepening and widening our understanding of both Britain and India in that period. So I think it's, it, it would be a shame that if we, we try to limit it and put it in a box. I know that we, have, we should have lots of questions. I've just been given the sign that we should be moving towards them. Um, I'm going to try and um, go through this with, um, with the iPad as well as, you know, um, hands in the in the crowd, so I th I believe there's a mic that goes around. Ah, perfect. There is a mic and there's a hand right there. The gentleman blue 
um, shared. Um, and I will, I will try and take as many questions as possible. Uh, thank you, that was fascinating. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the Indian sources that you were comparing the, uh, the journal uh, uh, and, and the, the English records with? Uh, where are they, what are they? Um, so the, the major source that I was using um, to juxtapose with Thomas Rowe's journal was Jahangir's memoirs, day-to-day -day memoirs, the Jahangir Nama. He starts writing it fairly early in his reign. Uh, he continues it for a fairly long period before hand it gets handed over. And in a way, he's copying the example of his great-grandfather, the founder of the Mughal emp Empire, Bab Babur, um, in doing it. And it's an astonishing literary text, I think. Um, it's very rare that we get the voice, unmediated voice, of a Mughal monarch in exactly, or a monarch or sovereign of any country in exactly the same way. But alongside that, I had multiple other sources. I was particularly drawn to recovering where I could voices of ordinary people outside the courtly circles. So sometimes that happens through um, there's a wonderful um, early example of autobiography called the Ardha Katanak, um, the half-life story by a merchant um, who is a direct contemporary of Roe and Jahangir. Um, so that gives us glimpses into someone who is very much on the margins of power, observing these otherwise what sounds like tumultuous changes <coughs> at court. But there are multiple other Sanskrit epics, um, various Dohe by Abdul Rahim, who is one of um, Jahangir's courtiers, um, who writes wonderfully and wittily and sharply about um, the terrible balancing act that one has to do as an intellectual and a politician <laughs> in any political scenario. Um, so all of that comes into the, this particular narrative, I think. I'm just going to um, try and take a couple of questions from here, partly because um, th this one's really interesting. Um, were there any particular protocols for greeting and presenting representatives of the new country, of a new country for the first time? I assume this is for the Mughal court. And did they have to observe any particular preparations for homage in this new contact at the court? Oh, that's such a wonderful question. Um, and the short answer is yes, many. Um, but in that sense, the Mughal court is no different from, say, the Ottoman um, court or, in, indeed, from James I's court. Um, diplomatic tussles about how many times you doff your hat and whether you doff it at all and how low you go in your bows is <laughs> always, always um, um, a critical point, a sticking point. Um, Roe, I mean, adopts that as a part of his diplomatic tussle with the Mughals, and that is particularly fascinating. He, um, I spent a lot of time juxtaposing what he was doing, and in a way, um, when 19th century kind of editors of Roe took his journal and those early days where he's thinking de about decoding Mughal diplomatic procedure, they interpret it as, you know, this is an Englishman being terribly English and look how strong he is and strong-minded. He will bow for nobody. Um, but interestingly, the, the kind of turns of phrases he uses, the kind of negotiations he uses are lifted straight from the notebook of the, the great bugbear of the English in this period, the Spanish ambassador, Gondomar who is the man you would love to hate if you were a 16th, 17th century, early 17th century Englishman in London in this period. Um, but he was also great at these diplomatic power plays. And Roe, who had been on the corners of James I's court, watching this Spanish man essentially twirl the court around his little finger, uses exactly the same tricks when he goes to Surat. I know there were... Oh, there the, are the two questions here. Um, so I think maybe um, first in the back and then, yes, and, and then I, I, I'm keeping an eye. Yeah, I've got you there. Oh, hi. hi. Um, 
you have to excuse me, I'm not like a very educated person in regards to Mughal India, but I am like a new history teacher. And I'm actually teaching this to my year sevens. And currently our like inquiry, our historical inquiry is, you know, how significant was Noor Jahan in regards to Mughal India? And we're comparing her to, um, for example, um, the Tudors and women in the UK at the time. So in regards to, um, hopefully you can help me help educate these kids because I have no clue what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I really don't. I'm just 26 years old. I'm just lighting my way through it. <laughs> but I just, this will really, really help me just understand more. Um, so obviously we're going at this point where we're concentrating on the women, especially in Nur Jahan. So in your opinion, how influential was she and how influential were women in the courts and economically compared to the UK at the time? That is a wonderful question, I think. Thank you for asking that. So I would probably start by comparing some of the preconceptions people have about women within Islamic worlds and women in Tudor England. We talk a lot about Elizabeth I um, and Mary, Queen of Scots, Mary Tudor, all of those powerful figures. Um, but here's the thing, if you think about legal rights of women, if you happen to be a woman in 16th, 17th century England, um, you were technically and legally a femme couverte, a covered woman, covered essentially by the male presences around you, either by your father or by your husband. So you, your economic power only came to the forefront as an independent individual if you were fortunate enough to be widowed. Um, and that does happen uh, because the plague, unfortunately, took away the, many of the men first. So the printing world, and there's a lot of research around this at the moment, the printing world early in early modern England is run um, oddly enough, by a lot of women in this period who are still publishing uh, uh, under the names of their dead husbands. Um, in Islamic law, women could retain a portion of wealth under their own name, and a lot of women did. This is not to say that Islamic women who followed Islam had endless freedom. We know that did not happen either in Tudor England, Christian, Protestant England, or in Mughal India. But it did mean that people like Noor Jahan were not alone in handling and being able to kind of manage huge amounts of resources. Um, Jahangir's mother herself ran one of the biggest ships uh, of, in Mughal trade. In fact, it's a huge ship and the Portuguese get into great trouble um, with the Mughals at one point because they try to capture that particular ship and their trade licenses are almost immediately withdrawn. Um, so I think it would be really useful perhaps and interesting for your students to think about just those economic assumptions we make or larger assumptions we make about women's lives and then to see where um, Noor Jahan sits within that. Um, one of the things that I had great fun doing in the book is juxtaposing images of Noor Jahan, a portrait of Noor Jahan with a portrait of Anna of Denmark, James I's, um, first of England's wife. Um, Noor Jahan is shown kind of um, cleaning her and holding her rifle. She was a great huntress, a great sharpshooter, and Jahangir is inordinately proud of her. There are repeated instances in his memoirs where he writes about how wonderful Noor Jahan was at hunting. James I, not quite. <laughs> um, he is not pleased, in fact, with a large part of his court. He was not pleased about this newfangled fashion that women had of wearing high hats that made them look taller, for instance. <laughs> Anna of Denmark has her portrait painted wearing, guess what? <laughs> um, and she positions her arm in a way which makes it very clear that this is a solitary portrait. It's a portrait that could not be hung next to a portrait of her husband. Um, so that juxtaposition might be an interesting one. Visual things always work really well, I think, if you want to get a point across. Yes, please. 
Hello? Yeah. Okay, that's just interesting, the shade that was going on there. Um, <laughs> so you kind of might have half answered my question because I'm coming at it from, um, I work on the Ottoman Empire and the minute you started talking about the influence of Nur Jahan, I thought, ooh, Harem Sultan, mm -hmm. Sultanate of Women. And I wondered if this was maybe part of a larger phenomena within the Mughal Empire, kind of like we have in, in, in the Ottoman Empire, where you actually had this maybe string or collection of very politically influential women who had what um, a type of influence maybe over the governing of the empire that some people might have been very concerned about. Um, yes, I think, again, um, there is very clearly a resonance there not simply with the Ottomans, but also perhaps with the Safavids in Persia, modern-day Iran. Um, and in each of these cases, I think partly the problem is because of certain historical assumptions that are made um, from the 18th century onwards about the harem being actually quite a different kind of place from what it really was. The harem structure was not simply about um, sexual licentiousness or essentially about a sovereign having a lot of women at his beck and call. It was a city within a city in each of these empires. And it was a city within a city, most importantly, governed largely by the women themselves. Um, and I think that parallel is really interesting because of course the, the other unspoken thing in this huge global network is the close network between those three Islamic superpowers, essentially in this period. Yeah. I'm going to, I know that we've, we've got lots of hands, but I know that the lady there in the blue, uh, sort of midway through, um, would you, yes. Yeah, you've, you've had your hand up for quite a while. I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to get as many people um, as I can. Hi. I should um, give shorter answers, shouldn't I? Well, if you feel um, like <laughs> Uh, hopefully this is a very quick question. Um, I find it very interesting that you've chosen this particular piece because I, I don't know a lot about um, um, India, but everything I've read about the origin of the empire doesn't have this story. It doesn't have that. Um, my question is, you've explained very well why you chose it. Why do you think not many people have chosen to write about this particular part? Because it doesn't fit the narrative of empire. Um, very, very simply. See, I'm following my rule of a short answer there. <laughs> Um, Roe does not get any much success, that's the thing. Um, and this story of waiting in a queue for the attention of, a, of an emperor who is studiously ignoring you does not fit that story of, you know, a great empire where the sun never sets. Yeah. I know that we've got two questions and I know we would had a hand up. There was a gentleman there with the, with the dark, yeah, yes. And then there's a hand up here that I'd like to just come to as well. But go ahead, please. Right. Thank you. That was a very insightful conversation. So uh, contrary to uh, Jangir's reign, down south, there was Deccan Sultanates as well, who are yeah. equally cosmopolitan or even more. Was there any interaction between them and the English or was there an ambassador from England? Um, no, there wasn't at that point because the Portuguese were focusing on, um, on the south at this particular point and the Dutch. So there are moments where Roe um, has meetings with his du Dutch contemporary and his Dutch counterpart. Um, and he writes about um, the Dutch going down to Masulipatam, for instance. Um, and he is aware to some extent about the possibilities in southern India. He's aware of, of other political structures. But let's face it, England at this point is a very, very small power within South Asia. So they had to focus their energies somewhere. They were already cash constrained, constrained in terms of people. Um, so they thought they would put their focus on Northern India, particularly on the Mughal Empire. In fact, they were, the East India Company was very unwilling to take Rose advice, which now in hindsight sounds actually something, you know, terribly kind of prescient in some ways of going to Bengal which is what they'd end up doing later on. Um, they simply, the East India Company in England decided that was too far to go. Their resources just wouldn't stretch. And I think we've got time for one last question, so. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, very interesting session so far, thank you very much. And I haven't read the book and I'm looking forward to reading it uh, soon. Um, actually, you answered the question partially, but I was really curious to know. Um, so Sir Thomas Rowe, 
um, I mean, I'm, I was curious to know as to how was he perceived. I mean, you mentioned that the Jahangir Nama was one of your sources. Um, from what I can remember, I don't think he was mentioned much in that. Was he? I mean, it was a footnote in history, the fact that, you know, he and the English uh, expedition went there at that point of time. But I'm curious to see from your research, how was he perceived both in India at that point of time and how was he perceived here in England? Because I know there's a painting of him... Um, uh, you know, approaching the court in the Houses of Parliament, mm -hmm. I think. There's a painting out there. Uh, so I suspect all of that is fairly recent, but at that point of time, how was he perceived? Uh, uh, you were uh, very both, generous both. and kind in saying that he might have been a footnote in the Engli Indian <laughs> accounts. He does not appear. In fact, none of the English appear in Jahangir's accounts. There are wonderful moments where Roe expends 10 pages on a meeting he's had with the emperor. The emperor talks about... Um, Hindi poems about trapping the bee within a lotus flower. <laughs> um, and the English ambassador doesn't appear. And that is a telling example of, I suppose, an indication of the really marginal role that the English played. For the Mughals, the Western European forces, they recognized were the Portuguese. They were quite interested in these newcomers because they knew that the Portuguese naval power was a threat. And they were quite deliberately, I argue in the book, both Nur Jahan and Khurram, the later Shah Jahan, were playing the Portuguese and the English against each other in their negotiations throughout this period, something that Roe did not realize. Um, the mural you talk about, again, is something that I talk about in the book. Roe enters English historiography around the late 19th, early 20th century. So that mural was commissioned in 1925. Um, it's just after the First World War. Britain decides that it needs to have something that, should I say it? Make, say it. make Britain great again. <laughs> um, and they commissioned the series of murals in the Houses of Parliament, and Roe is one of the features there. Interestingly, however, the person who paints it, Rosenstein, is himself a second-generation immigrant. And, and I loved uh, this moment where I discovered that his father had come over to England, guess what, to deal in wool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to quote Riz, Riz Ahmed and say, immigrants, we get things done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, I do have one, one question that was sent in that I just want to know because it's a very short answer. Um, it may not actually apply to your period, but this is a good one. What's the weirdest, weirdest thing that the British stole from Mughal India? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to ask that. Oh, goodness. Um, you know, in this particular period, perhaps the weirdest thing is the Do Piazza. <laughs> okay, you're um, going to have to explain that. So... This is the thing, there was, you, you know, when you've got to write something that is inordinately long and it's taking a long time during the lockdown, you get distracted. So I got <laughs> distracted by recipes. There, there's a lot of talk about food. Roe suffers from dysentery throughout history. <laughs> he sits through numerous banquets where there are 60 courses sailing past in front of me, um, in front of him, and the poor man is just sitting there. Um, but I, uh, one of the things that keep cropping up in these um, descriptions by Roe and by his contemporaries is this dish that they all adore. And they say it's a dish of meat and onions. And then only one account by Roe's chaplain, Edward Terry, actually allows me to, uh, allowed me to identify what it is, where he says he found out how this was cooked um, and you get the sense that their own cook would probably somehow get this recipe. And he says, they call it the Do Piazza. So there you have it. Do Piazza is my, gets wow. my vote. That's, <laughs> yeah, uh, that wasn't something I would have thought of, but wow. <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much. Please get the book. It's really lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you. But well, sorry, that was really loud. <laughs> I'll be quieter. Thank you, Nandini and Sunny. Um, fascinating discussion. Um, as Sunny said, the book is on sale outside, and if you would like to have a copy signed, please purchase one first, and then um, there will be a little queue, and Nandini sat on a table ready to sign. Um, also, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the sign language interpreters who've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Kate, Kate and Anne-Marie, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.